Thanks, Sally. It's uh, great to be here and great to be uh, on the talking circuit again. Haven't done this for three or four years. We were supposed to go over to the Kimberleys when COVID broke out. Uh, and uh, lucky I didn't go because then it was all locked down. I wouldn't have got back. I'd still be over there, but that wouldn't be a bad place either. OK, so I want to talk about uh, best practice pain relief and vaccination. So we've got two sort of topics in one. And uh, I didn't know where to pitch this talk because I didn't know we've probably got people who've done pharmacology. Who's done pharmacology when they went through as an undergraduate? Biochemistry. I I've kept it fairly basic because I didn't know how deep to go into the Krebs cycle and the, all the enzyme things and the immunology and the IgAs and the IgGs and that. So I've kept it basic. We can turn the air conditioner up. Right. <laughs> First of all, pain. Pain is a very personal thing, as you all aware. Everyone suffered it, and we all know what it's about, but you can't share it too well. They reckon childbirth is the worst pain of all, and us mere mortals don't know that, mere males. Pain mitigation in cattle, though, it's becoming an expectation. We need to know what's out there, and we need to know what we're using, and we need to know when to use it. When I first graduated, we were still spaying cattle without ripping a hole in the guts and taking the ovaries out without local anaesthetic. So we've come a fair way in the last 40 years. So today in this segment, we want to talk about the different types of pain, uh, nociceptor versus inflammation, local anaesthesia versus analgesia, uh, what products are commercially available, what are your requirements as far as the animal welfare standards go, and pain relief is a package other factors need to be considered. Number one, you must be able to do your animal husbandry very well and know how to do it. So it's okay using pain relief, but also know how to do the procedures, the basic animal husband procedures. MLA have got a good publication out. Uh, it was worked through the Animal Welfare Organisations, Cattle Council, a lot of people involved in this. and. Uh, it's a good document to have. Uh, the better you are at doing the procedure, the quicker you do it and do it efficiently, the less pain is involved full stop without any of these other drugs. Who would go to the dentist these days and get their tooth drilled without a local anaesthetic? Does anyone still go with... I mean, I, when we were a kid, we'd get bundled in the car, taken down to Ipswich, sit outside the dental surgery, hear this noise going... Zzzz, we're terrified. Then you get in the chair and they drilled your tooth and you'd be hanging on to that chair for well, dear life without local anaesthetic getting your tooth drilled. And then when they hit the pulp, it ropes through the roof. Most people have local anaesthetic so they know what it's like. You come out of the dentist and you can't feel your lip and you can't talk and swallow. But anyway, who would use Penadol though and not take the local anaesthetic when they go to get their tooth drilled? You don't do it. So there's a role for both places, and we want to talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so ibuprofen and paracetamol, they're drugs that you're probably familiar with, versus lignocaine. There's acute pain versus uh, chronic pain, and both associated with animal husbandry procedures. The nociceptor pain occurs when the procedure is being performed and the inflammatory of pain occurs after. So you'll see these animals with uh, infected um, horns or scrotums after they've been castrated uh, and uh, that they were in pain for could be a week or two after the procedure. Nociceptor pain. It's the response of the body's sensory nervous system towards actual or potential. This is what happens when you put your hand on the hot stove. It's the body's defence to tell you, oh, don't do that. You feel the pain straight away. The blisters and all the inflammation and swelling come later. But that initial pain is a nociceptor pain. The receptors are telling you, don't do something stupid like cut your, knife, cut your uh, hand with a butcher knife or put your hand on the hot stove. The sensory endings are activated by, these, uh, by the such stimuli, and these are known as nociceptors. And it's the first stage of pain. And it's designed by the body to protect you from doing physical damage. It, what happens in leprosy, you don't feel pain anymore. And that's why you get all these, uh, in those parts of your limbs where you, where you lose sensation, 
you get injured and then you uh, don't feel the pain. So that's basically what happens in leprosy. But the thing is, um, things like uh, pulling the somatic cord when you're doing a castration or cutting through the horns, uh, that is nociceptor pain as well. So they feel it straight away. So immediate and it's usually short-lived or acute. Ah, don't do that again, Jeff. But then you've got to live with the inflammatory pain. Inflammatory pain is, is the natural body's reaction to harmful physical, chemical or infectious stimuli and to remove the damaged tissue. So after you've damaged the tissue, then the body's got to go through this repair process. And that's when you start to get swelling and uh, inflammation and getting rid of all the damaged tissue. Neutrophils, and if you've got an active open infection, you get uh, neutrophils, that's where the pus, these are your dead white cells uh, accumulating, they have to get rid of. There's usually heat, swelling and redness, and it can be long lasting and chronic. Anesthesia versus analgesia. Anesthesia is the loss of physical sensation that involves loss of motor as well as the stimuli of feeling the pain, okay? And it's either general or it's uh, local. Now I had my hip done last year and I had general and local. They put an epidural in my spine because there is a big benefit in recovery if you can get rid of that, even though you're under general anaesthetic, st still you have impact from pain and so the, the pain responses in humans is we a lot to learn, but it's, it's progressed a lot. So I was up and walking within three days because of the, the way we've managed and controlled pain. So it's immediate and short acting, eliminates, anesthesia eliminates that feeling when you get cut, okay? Or when the, when the dentist uh, drill goes into your tooth or when he pulls it out. And it eliminates the pain at that part of the body being numbed but it wears off, as you're well aware, and then you feel pain a few days later. Vets often use local anesthesia to make a diagnosis of lameness in a horse. As you know, you can feel your funny bone, you feel that ulnar nerve running there. Well, there's a lot of places on horses and cattle and whatnot where you can feel the local nerves come out. You inject some local in there around the nerve, take away the pain and you can work out, you make your diagnosis on where the lameness is. And it's uh, analgesia pain you know, is, is pain relief without loss of feeling. So you don't lose your motion with, with analgesia. Local anaesthetics. We do now have some local anaesthetics that are available for use in cattle. Trisolvin's the main one. You can buy it. Uh, it's an over-the-shelter um, product, over-the-counter over the product. What's it contain and how do you use it? Well. It contains lignocaine, which is your local anaesthetic, and it contains bupivacaine, which is your longer acting. So it, it gives you immediate relief and a little bit longer for about three or four hours. It's applied after the, it's usually applied after the procedure on the, on the open wound. It was designed for sheep for mulesing initially, but we can use it for branding and castration and dehorning. And, and as soon as you open it up, you can put it on. It will not, it will not contain the pain that's re from pulling out the, ripping out the spermatic cord, okay? They'll still feel that. You have to really go in and, and uh, inject if you wanted to uh, relieve the pain there. And it also contains adrenaline. Adrenaline makes sure that the, the local anaesthetic stays in that spot and doesn't diffuse away, restricts the blood vessels, and it's got, a, it's got an antiseptic in it as well, centromide. I've already said that, it's applied locally, usually after the procedure, and it does relieve that pain straight away for about four to six hours. That's the cost. There is a cost, and that's roughly about uh, $1.29 for about a 100 kg beast. So uh, if you're doing wieners that are um, about 150 kgs, or we should be doing them earlier, but that's not always possible in Northern Australia, to get them in as calves, so it will, you'd be looking at probably about $2 a, a head to treat them. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, NSAID. 
and these are your ibuprofens, if you like. Uh, and these are a non-cortical. We don't use cortisone because cortisone, even though it's a great pain relief, also decreases the body's immune response. It decreases your white cell production and whatnot. So, but these are, these are great for uh, anti-inflammatory responses. Um, they reduce inflammation. They inhibit leukocyte infiltration into the inflamed areas. They've been used in uh, people for ages. Nurofen, Voltaren. Uh, and they're now available for cattle in routine cattle husbandry procedures. And uh, they take about 15 to 30 minutes to work. So you just don't get an immediate response. It's got to get into the blood system and go to the locals, uh, go to the area where it's needed. And they last for nine hours or more. Some of them last for a day or more. And what's available in the marketplace? Well, buckle Jesic is the one that's available for most producers to use. It's meloxicam. There are some anti-inflammatories you cannot use in food producing animals. Phenylbutazone is one of them. We use them widely in horses, but they're banned in cattle. So, but meloxicam is available to be used in cattle. It, it's administered inside the cheek. It's, it's not a drench. It goes inside the buccal cavity and is absorbed to the inside of the cheek. Well, that's better, yeah. Starting to work now. It's an S4 uh, and has to be purchased from a veterinarian, uh, but usually there's no problems now. Vets will dispense that. Um, has a withholding period though, so you just don't go and do it. Well, you wouldn't do it anyway, but it does have a withholding period and you need to be aware of those. And it has an export slaughter interval of 21 days in meat cattle. And that's the cost of it, so uh, it's not cheap. But if you're looking at about 140 kg, you don't got to. I don't think I have a no pointer. Doesn't matter. 140 kg animal would cost you two dollars eighty. 70 kg there on the left, and so uh, roughly a 30 kg animal, 60 cents. If you're into the bigger properties and bigger animals, it's going to cost you around about that. So, even though it's uh, got an expense, it's probably something that we're going to have to wear. And at the price of beef, we can't afford not to. Medicam 20. Uh, that's the injectable one. Uh, that is a, an S4 again. As veterinarians, veterinarians cannot prescribe a drug, an S4 or an S8, unless they see the beast. They'll get deregistered. So you don't go along to a vet and ask for penicillin or antibiotics or these sort of S4 drugs, because you probably won't get them unless, so unless the vet has been seeing the animal, can they prescribe the drug under the Veterinary Surgeons Act? You need to understand that, so don't get too upset with the veterinarians who won't prescribe your drugs. If the vet's been treating the animals though, like uh, for a crook foot or something, you can come in and get another bottle, not a problem. But that's part of the regulations. That's the cost, about 75 cents. That's the injectable stuff. Injectable stuff probably might even work a little bit better than the buccal stuff, but the buccal stuff's available, fairly readily available. Uh, and, and you can use it now. So there you've got the two products. You've got the trisulfan and the meloxicam or the buccalgesic, which is, which is meloxicam. Everyone happy with that? Whether you sit with that? Is that Yeah, look, we, we can have a talk about that. I'm not even up with that, to tell you the truth. I don't know where that discussion... I know Numb Nuts has come under a bit of pressure. Uh, and, and even, yeah, to get it as an S5. So that debate, I think, is going on still, but you're probably right. If you want to know where you stand on animals, Google this. It's the Australian Standard Animal Welfare Guidelines, and they are accepted by all state regulations. The state departments regulate animal welfare, and this is a national code. For instance, a person castrating uh, an animal, they must do it uh, before six months of age if they can. Uh, but if they, if they, and so there's been a little bit of slippage here because if you don't get the animals in until 12 months of age, which happens in Northern Australia, you can get away with it up to 12 months of age where you can do a procedure like castration or disbudding or dehorning on cattle less than 12 months of age. But normally down south, you would, uh, if you put something in the yard after six months of age, 
you could get reported and uh, and prosecuted. Spying, spying, be aware of that as well. Uh, you cannot do that now without local anaesthetic, uh, especially flank spying, uh, either by a veterinarian or an accredited person. I think accredited people can do it in Queensland. Um, local anaesthetic is very useful for doing the skin incision and uh, doing the stitching up afterwards, which never used to happen back 40 years ago. So, I meant to go back. Take home messages. We didn't talk about polled animals, but there are other ways of addressing animal welfare sounds with, with animal husbandry procedures. And one is selecting for poll gene uh, and marketing entire males. Now, I'm not quite sure where that marketing of entire males goes, but for some of the uh, Muslim countries, uh, they prefer entire males, and even Israel does. So there are opportunities there, and we do have uh, Professor uh, <laughs> Fitzpatrick here who did some very good work on entire males, and uh, they actually make you more money, believe it or not. And they grade. If you get them young enough, they will grade MSA. So there's a whole world of opportunity out there we haven't even touched on yet. So we don't, it doesn't make sense to, to cut their nuts out and put a HGP in their ear when we can grow them out better without animal welfare concerns. We just need to make them polled as well. Adapt your best uh, practice husbandry procedures um, when you're doing your procedure. So these are things that don't even require drugs. If you're doing pain relief, um, make sure that, uh, well, properties now are looking towards becoming accredited or recognised for their animal welfare standards. And uh, they are looking for a place in the market where they can sell a, a welfare friendly produced animal. And that's coming, that's coming. And there's places now that probably do that, market their animals as being welfare friendly. It's a bit like caged chooks or caged eggs. Uh, there's products available, we talked about them. Most pain relief products help with some of the pain in animal, but not all of the pain, not all of the pain. Use a combination, will provide the best pain relief. Uh, some are short acting and some are longer acting. So does everyone understand where they sit these products? One is for immediate, when you're doing the procedure, one is for aftercare. Both can be used. No, they're withholding periods when you're giving advice to your client. Vaccination. We're okay, I think, aren't we on time? 10 minutes. I've got to talk about vaccination as well. Now, everyone's probably uh, used vaccine, been vaccinated themselves, and so I didn't know where to pitch this talk as well. But in this section, we want to know what diseases exist and, uh, and understand the interaction between the host, the agent, and the environment. Different types of immunity. We want to talk about the different types of vaccines. How do you make the decision? You go into uh, a, uh, an elders or a, not landmark anymore. Uh, but anyway, you go into one of those, there's vaccines everywhere. What, what do you use and when do you use it? And, and of course you could buy everything if you wanted to. <laughs> What's available and how do you store and handle them? So that's what we want to cover in that. Must understand about endemic disease. They're the diseases, endemic diseases are the diseases that are present in Australia all the time. Some endemic diseases can be eradicated and some can be controlled and some we have to live with, okay? Exotic diseases, we don't vaccinate for, you won't get a vaccine for exotic diseases in Australia, okay? I didn't realise this, but there's a fair bit of a noise out there about foot and mouth at the moment. We'll have a session on that anyway, but we don't vaccinate for foot and mouth and you can't get it because part of the way of getting free of disease is to is stop vaccinating for a certain time before you can even be declared free. So we would not use foot and mouth vaccine in Australia. I've had people ring up in the last few weeks very uh, concerned about getting foot and mouth vaccine. You can't get it in Australia. You wouldn't be allowed to use it, okay? Because we have to, part of the thing of being declared free is saying we're not vaccinating, we're not covering up the disease. Disease is all about agent, host and environment. Why diseases happen differently or occur differently you have to understand there's this reaction going on. I haven't got time to go through all this, but just be bear in mind that foot and mouth in England 
is completely different than foot and mouth in India. In, in, in England, we went through uni, we had these expectations that it had spread on the fog and go 20 kilometres overnight and start up the whole, and in New Zealand's the same sort of deal. In, in, in the Asian countries, it's direct contact. The virus does not like heat, it does not like sunlight, so it dies fairly quickly. And it's all about knowing about why diseases occur in some situations, why they act differently in other situations, when do we need to vaccinate. I just want you to think down, take 30 seconds to write down what you think is a perfect vaccine. A perfect vaccine. What would you like to see in your vaccine? I don't have to give it once. <laughs> That'd be a good one, yep. But there are other, other attributes too. It doesn't hurt your arm. You could get it orally. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things you could do. Okay. I went and saw a colleague of ours. Some of you might know this fellow, Stuart McLennan. Uh, I went and saw him two days ago and I told him I was coming up here to do this talk. And he said, uh, well, put me up as a prime example of someone who's had four vaccinations and now he's lying in hospital paralyzed from the, way, uh, from the chest down, can't lift his leg. Uh, so if you, if you know him and give him a ring because he's it's not a good place to be. He had COVID a couple of weeks ago after going to the Territory and now he's been in hospital. And he's he got a long recovery in front of him. Immunity. Let's talk about immunity. Immunity to disease is obtained through the presence of antibodies to that disease in an animal. Okay? It's when we have antibodies to fight the disease. Antibodies are proteins produced by the body to destroy disease-carrying organisms or to neutralise toxins produced by an infectious agent. That's what, that's what antibodies do. Antibodies are disease-specific to that agent <laughs> that is causing the clinical disease. So you, you have to have a, a vaccination against a particular agent, whether it's botulism or tick fever or whatever. You, you just, so it's specific to the disease. And there are two types of immunity, active and passive. Active immunity. Active immunity comes from exposure to an infectious agent that stimulates your immune system to produce antibodies to that disease. Okay? And that's when you get vaccinated. You also get active immunity if you've had the disease. You can get antibodies. Like, for instance, can anyone think of a disease in cattle that will give you good lifelong immunity once you get it? Tick fever? Yep. Well, three day sickness I'm thinking too. That's why you see it in young cattle and when old cattle that haven't been exposed get it, they come down like a bundle of whatever and fall in a heap, whereas young cattle you hardly know they got it. So okay, it's required through natural or infection or vaccination. Uh, vaccine induced immunity occurs by producing a killed or a weakened form of the disease organism. So we have different vaccines we can use. Uh, antibodies are produced by the animals will recognise the infectious agents and nullify it immediately. And it's usually long lasting and sometimes it lasts the whole of your lifetime. Passive immunity. We also have passive immunity. Passive immunity is when we acquire antibodies to disease uh, rather than being produced from our own system. So passive immunity, when I'm thinking cattle, comes with colostrum. Calves are born with no antibodies whatsoever. They must suck that colostrum. They must get it within the first 30, 36 hours because that's when the, the gut can absorb the IgA molecules that go in through the small intestine. So that's passive immunity. It doesn't last for long. We also can get passive immunity by giving antitoxins, such as anti snake venen or, or tet tetanus uh, antitoxins. Uh, the major advantage of passive immunity is that it works straight away. You've got the antibodies there straight away, but it doesn't last forever. And therefore, that's why we need to be vaccination programmed so we get long-lasting immunity. What are vaccines? Well, uh, vaccines are basically just proteins or antigens that stimulate a protective disease response. Uh, you can get uh, immune response to either bacteria or viruses or even protozoans. Uh, you probably need two shots. It tr triggers an immune system. Uh, if the animal does survive natural infection, or, or um, you might have to challenge the, the animal 
several times or even every year. Some vaccines aren't as good as others. For instance, we'll talk about that a little bit, hopefully, if we've got time. We've still got time. Some vaccines we have to give yearly. Some vaccines we have to give every seven years. If you haven't had a tetanus shot or a cut, you probably need to get a tetanus shot every seven years. Um, Ephemeral fever is a classic though, it will give you, natural immunity will give you lifelong, uh, natural infection will give you lifelong immunity. The types of vaccines, well we have killed vaccines. Now killed vaccines, are, does anyone know some of the killed vaccines? Leptospirosis, lepto is a killed vaccine. Your, your clostridial diseases, five in one are a killed vaccine. They have no ability to cause disease at all. And you, can, you might get a side, I don't know of any side effects from using these vaccines, but you might get a side effect. Not like the uh, corona, COVID vaccine, but... Uh, so they don't cause disease. They contain the right protein, which has been modified, and they give you a protective immune response. What's going on here now, I've lost it. Ah. Normally require... Killed, va killed vaccines normally, not always, not all require two shots, three to four weeks apart. The drug companies and the manufacturers put this on because this is the ideal. We want to talk about what's not ideal and practical in a, in a beef cattle operation in Northern Australia where it takes you two or three months to do a whole breed of muster. So how can you get your calves back in to give them a second shot before you even process them or weed them? So there has to be compromises in what we advise and how we do it. Uh, and then you can have booster shots. Um, over time, the antibody levels fall and you might need a booster shot. Um, okay, let's talk about this. This is what's going on here. This is your passive immunity. This is from your colostrum. <coughs> Normally, your vaccine, if you, get, like if you take your dog along to a vet, they can't give it a distemper shot before 12 weeks. Does anyone ask why? They give you a measles shot, which sort of gives you some protection, but doesn't give you the full protection. It's related, measles related to distemper. But if you give a vaccine here to a dog, it won't work. So you wasted, well, it might not work. The thing is, we don't know what passive immunity is passed down from the bitch to the pups, because um, some, some bit, the bitch works differently than a cow. The bitch passes her, antibodies across the placenta. So the pups are born with immunity. They don't need the colostrum. But we don't know. So they give you a measles shot at 12 to 16 weeks, then they give you the first shot, then you come back and get your booster shot, okay? And the booster shot just stimulates you. are already sort of stimulated. You hit them with a booster and then that gets you, your antibody levels right up. And then they might take years to come down. You might need a booster shot. Okay. Adjuvants. You've heard that word adjuvant? It's what you put with a vaccine to make sure it works effectively. So it's slow release of the antigen, continual release of the antigen, so the body's getting challenged and it's building up its immunity over time. It can cause a lump. Now, with vibriosis, you'll see a lump. Often with vibriosis, you'll see a lump on the side of the neck. Whenever I'm doing bull testing, I always like to say I like to see two lumps. The ones between the back legs, which we look at very closely, and the one on the side of the neck. So it does cause a lump. That's why you do, you do your vaccination and your needles on the neck, because it's not affecting the prime cuts like on the rump or on the ribs. Live or attenuated vaccines. Now they're usually developed from a, a weakened virus or, or a protozoa, and uh, they're allowed to replicate in the body and to generate immune response. They've, they give you a very good, uh, very good uh, antibody cover, attenuated vaccines. When we went through uni, Lee and I, we used to see distemper. We haven't had eradication for program, but I don't think Lee would have seen distemper in the last 30 years, and I certainly haven't. The vaccine's so good and everyone gets their dogs vaccinated. You can eradicate diseases just about with just vaccines. And this is an attenuated live vaccine, it's the distemper one. The blood vaccine for cattle is an attenuated live vaccine. That's why when you give a blood vaccination, you have to monitor your animals for the next two to four weeks because they can come down with tick fever. Can. Not very common, but it can happen. So that's why you monitor them. 
especially if you've got a $30,000 Wagyu bull you've just bought from down south and you bring him up, you need to just keep an eye on him. There are drugs that you can treat for. What, what did that say? Anything important? <laughs> <laughs> ah, right, right, yes, right, right, we've covered that. Should I vaccinate? Well, the first thing to know is, is the disease present? No use vaccinating for a disease you don't have. Uh, what is the cost and, and the impact of the disease, including the welfare and workplace health and safety? Is the vaccine available and what is the efficacy of the vaccine? What is the cost of the vaccine, including the mustering? So the vaccine cost is usually only the small cost. The big cost is getting the animals in and processing them and having staff available to be able to give them the shots they require. Are there alternate options? And what are the cost benefits? In beef production, we always do like to have a herd health programs worked out where we look at the cost of implementing a, a strategy and seeing whether it's going to be cost effective. Not everything you do is cost effective, so you have to work out from your maths and your sums whether it's worth doing. Um, so I like decision trees. I'm bred and born on decision trees. I like to see things in black and white. That's, I don't know whether that's introvert or extrovert or some other vert, but it's just how my brain works. Has the, have you got a disease for a start? That's number one. Number two is, is there a vaccine available? Is there a vaccine available? And if there's no vaccine available, you don't have to worry about making that decision then, do you? No vaccine, so you can't vaccinate. Okay, now it comes back to prevalence, economic impact and effectiveness. Uh, excuse these slides, they're not the biggest. But that's prevalence, economic. So how prevalent is the disease? How widespread is it? Is it affecting my whole herd or is it only affecting a little bit of my herd? Um, what's the economic impact? How effective is the disease? Now, I guess tetanus is a classic one. You don't see very much tetanus. So the prevalence of tetanus is very low. The clostridial tetani organisms everywhere in the ground, some places it's worse than others. But the cost of the vaccine is very, very cheap. And uh, even if the prevalence is only 0.1%, that's one in a thousand, at the price of wieners, the price of wieners now, $2,000 or 1500 you can do your maths. And then we have to know whether the, the impact is high or low, whether the effectiveness is poor or good. Uh, if it's a high vaccine, high cost vaccine, and uh, not very effective, you might not use it. Low cost vaccine, changes the whole thing. And so that's the, that's the decision tree that I like to use when I'm looking at vaccination. Okay? Do you need time to lock that in to the hard drive? <laughs> so we can go through some of those and you can probably fit all your vaccines into those sort of categories. And of course, don't forget this one. Don't forget, are there other alternatives to vaccination? You don't always have to vaccinate. It depends on, like, you're not going to be vaccinating your steers against abortion, are you? Would you? No. You, you might use lepto as a strange one because there's a bit of workplace health and safety goes in that as well. But generally speaking, there are diseases for females to prevent uh, uh, reproductive diseases. Um, other control methods you need to look at. Time of year, when does the disease occur? A vector control, can you, can you control the tick? Uh, if you buy this Wagyu bull and you might bring him up, well, first of all, you'll probably put Akatak or one of those chlorfluorazuron on him, or, or fluorazuron, I should say, not chlorfluorazuron, fluorazuron, which is Akatak. That'll give you protection for th four to six weeks, maybe less, if you've got a resistance. But you can do that while the vaccine's working. Because vaccines don't work all of a sudden. Now the other thing is, if you're still in doubt about whether to vaccinate or not, do an odds and evens trial. This is the most underutilised bit of research that no one uses. Okay, and it's so easy. You've got NLIS tags, you've got ear tags. Just do every odd beast or every even beast and follow them through. If you're using Vibrio, follow them through to see whether they've, see whether they got in calf. We've done that in some projects in Vic River and over in the Pilbara, 
we did a, a Vic River one um, with Vibrio. 10% difference in conception rates. And all we did was just vaccinate the odd ones. The exposure factors are the same. The protected ones were able to get pregnant at a higher rate than the un... We did the same in the Pilbara. Have we got a problem with botulism? Well, a lot of people went over there weren't vaccinating at this time. We vaccinated every even animal and what... 8% more animals survived after three years from those that had the botulism shot. You don't have to rely on MLA or other research organisations. This is stuff you can do at home if you're, if you're still querying whether you should vaccinate. Now, there's a hope, heap of vaccines out there. Uh, I was hoping we'd have a tips and tools. I don't think we have. I didn't see them there. On, on vaccination and pain relief that we've just developed MLA, but it's still in the publication stage, so it's not out there yet. So, what's the time? Uh, 11.36. How many minutes? Uh, you've got 12. 12, thank you. 12. <laughs> Good. Well, so th they're the diseases, clostridial diseases, five in one. I think that's a no-brainer myself. Uh, even in, it, we've done a bit of work up in the Northern Territory with odds and evens, we didn't find a response. But when you're looking at one in, one in a thousand, one in a thousand, it's very hard to get those numbers high enough to find a response. Beauty about this though, it's, it's five in one. So you've got, down, down on the coast, you'll get uh, blackleg, which you don't see uh, in the inland. It's mainly in the flooded areas where these animals just die. Good wieners, just, sappy wieners just die. So anyone sort of south of Rockhampton, uh, always does five in one because you get black leg protection. So you, s you see that. It's very dramatic when you go out and you see three dead wieners leg up, do an autopsy and you'll find uh, damaged, damaged muscles uh, and it costs 40 cents a dose. So it's very cheap. It's the cheapest vaccine. But the other thing why you'd use five in one, it also covers for pulpy kidney. All feedlots, when they induct their cattle, give them five and one to stop pulpy kidney. Because as soon as you go into a feedlot, you change from a pasture diet to a concentrate diet, and that's when you get uh, pulpy kidney disease, because the organism grows in that high carbohydrate diet, and you, it's a sudden death thing too. And as the two Ronnie said, death can be fatal. <laughs> Lepto uh, is the next one up there. Uh, Lepto's all over Australia, there's no doubt about that. And when I was at Gundawindi, we used to vaccinate, every time we preg test, we'd vaccinate with lepto. There's a workplace health and safety issue here. And so even now some of the corporates are looking at vaccinating for lepto because there's been some incidences of lepto, a zoonotic disease, people coming down with lepto in the top end. Now, whether that's occurred from pig hunting or what, I don't know, because rats and uh, pigs, everything can get lepto. Uh, but I haven't... All the vaccines I've used, I've never seen a response. I haven't seen an outbreak of lepto in, in beef cattle when I was practicing, but it's certainly prevalent in dairy herds. You would not have a dairy without a lepto vaccination program in place, and you must give it every 12 months. <coughs> and in some dairies, you must give it every six months. And you give it when they're pregnant, mid-pregnant, because that's when you get the best response, because you want to stop abortion. When I went to Turkey to work in a feedlot, we used to give every vaccination known to mankind to these animals when they inducted them, and we didn't stop the problem. Every time I'd drive to work in the morning, I'd find two or three animals, no, sometimes five animals, I had an autopsy. What's going on in this feedlot? Even though they were vaccinated against all these things. You can't have animals under stress when you vaccinate. That's why feedlots like to background, so they can get on top of their programs and get cattle into the feedlots. We don't have a big problem with respiratory disease in Australia, but it's still best to keep them in their social groups, decrease the stress when you're doing your vaccination. When to vaccinate? Well, the cost of vaccine is usually the small part. Some of the vaccines like Vibrio will be up around $9, uh, and we can talk about that later, about what you, whether you vaccinate just the bulls or your maiden heifers or the whole lot, depends on your risk. Always do a risk assessment. Look at decision tree. It's the expense of mustering and handling. If you've got to get stock in twice to give them a shot. When you get your five in one vaccination, say two shots four to six weeks apart. Well, who can do that? Most of them get their shot at the branding, at, at, the, at weaning with the branding cradle. Okay? 
But do it. Do it when you do the, before you do the procedure or when you do the procedure. Um, I had a pastor ring up once. He'd lost 120 head with, with um, fairly well-known pastors. 120 head with tetanus because he was using emasculators and they're more risky. Emasculators and rings are more risky than open wound because the, the wound can't drain. Anyway, he, was, he wanted to know whether to use antitox. And I said, use, use the vaccine when you do the procedure. Tetanus takes about 10 days to develop. So by the time your tetanus is starting to develop, you're starting to get antibodies. You won't read that on the packet. Uh, there's several opportunities in normal calendar when you can get cattle in, when it's cost effective to do it. Uh, one is branding or weaning. Uh, with preg testing, certainly if you're doing in the lepto, you do it when you preg test. Vaccinate all your pregnant ones. Uh, and when you're doing your heifer selection or your bull testing, make sure you have a vaccination, you discuss vaccination with your client when you're doing that. I would certainly, look, Vibrio is taking off at the moment. It's always been around and it comes in waves. But at the moment, when you read through the ACV list, you'll see Vibrio is happening in places that people are changing bulls with their Wagyu and F1 crosses and we're getting Vibrio in maiden heifers and all sorts of things. So it's around, it's still there, and uh, there's a very good vaccine out. Rules of vaccination, follow the manufacturer's instructions where possible. Not always possible. You're going to give me a bell shortly? Um, sure. Ding. <laughs> oh, right. <-o. laughs> manufacturer's instructions, uh, use separate syringes. If you can mix a vaccine, the, the, the manufacturers that do it, like seven in one, don't mix them. Vaccinate at different sites, vaccinate at weaning. If the tick fever is being administered, you probably should do that two weeks later, but if you've got a $30,000 waggy bull coming up, do him straight away and then get, get the other vaccines later. Um, don't use disinfectants for modified live vaccines and thoroughly wash your guns and put them away in a clean place and wash them again before you use them. Handling and storage. People think the heat's a big thing. Well, it is too. You need to stop your vaccines boiling in the cattle yard. But freezing is the biggest issue. Don't put it in the fridge and let the bloody thing uh, freeze. That'll blow your vaccine straight away. Store according to the directions. Tick fever has a very short sh shelf life. You have to be able to get that and do your animals within a, a week of getting it. Because you've got live red blood cells and it goes off quickly. So you need to get that out of the system. When you're giving the needle, make sure you set your needle up properly. You, don't want, you, need, you want your bevel going in that way, uh, not the other way, which doesn't show on that slide, which is a bit sad. Um, anyway, you put your bevel up the wrong way, it doesn't go in properly. So you get additional information. There's an Immune Ready website. You can go on there. The, the Cattle Vets and uh, uh, Animal Health Australia and Cattle Council and Dairy Australia put out this Immune Ready. There's a lot of information on that. And uh, question time. <laughs>